Musical Hell is hitting the high seas next year. Check out the video information to find out how you can join me and the hit musical Six on the Norwegian Bliss. This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Yes, of course I'm ready to continue. I'm here, aren't I? I know, I know, that last one took a lot out of me, but I've had a nice long break and even snuck in an extra week or so, so I'm fine. I'm fine. Look, don't fuss over me and tell me what the next case is. Okay, I know I didn't hear your inarticulate jabbering properly. It sounded like you said Mr. Quilp. Oh, you did. Well then, our next offender is Mr. Quilp. So apparently in the 1970s, Reader's Digest decided to branch out from the realm of grocery store checkouts and old people's coffee tables and try its hand at producing a few movie musicals. After the one-two punch of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, they traded Mark Twain for Charles Dickens with this adaptation of The Old Curiosity Shop. Anthony Newley, best known to this court as the pet food salesman from Dr. Doolittle, both wrote the songs and plays the story's villain, whose role has been expanded to that of title character. Which, as the kids these days say, certainly was a choice. So let's examine the case of Mr. Quilp and see how it panned out. The setting, as is de rigueur for Dickens, is grimy Victorian London, although the underscore has more of a 1970s variety show vibe. Well, what have we here? Please, sir, I seem to have lost my way. Ah, uh, well, there's no shame in that, ma'am. That's, uh, that's a weakness in us all. This dandyish fellow is Richard Swiveller. If anyone out there is looking for a good literature-based porn name, Dick Swiveller is a great place to start. And the young lady asking his assistance is the beautiful, virtuous, and innocent little Nell Trent. In case you're not familiar with her story or the fates of beautiful, virtuous, and innocent Victorian girls in general, I'll just advise you not to get too attached. Nell immediately establishes her too-good-for-this-sinful-earthness by singing a sweet song about love and goodness and puppies and also sin number one, Happiness Pie. And when I'm in a dither, I give me time to say Don't get in a flither, or a pucker, or a huddle, or a fix Contrasting Nell's sunny philosophy with the grim reality that is industrial-aged London sounds like a great idea on paper, but the movie never cashes in on the opportunity and just ends up making Nell look insipid and foolish. Speaking of insipid, the overdose of Mary Poppins-esque positivity in the lyrics further undermines the feeble attempts at irony. Take a little dab of hope, add a lucky bag of beans, sprinkle some love into a shovel full of dreams. Swiveller is a down-on-his-luck gentleman more interested in the monetary form of life fulfillment, but he's kind enough to see Nell to the curiosity shop owned by her grandfather and take the old man to task for letting the girl roam about unsupervised. Granddad points out that poor people don't have a whole lot of options before hinting that he plans to secure Nell's future and heading out on a mysterious errand. And that's where we'll leave them for now as we check in with our title character, who emphasizes his evilness by beating up urchins and singing a catalog of his misdeeds. The real McQuilp of fame, as cunning as a weasel. Every little breeze whisper my name. Having Anthony Newley play Quilp is sin number two on several levels, chief of them being how much space the character takes up as a result. Daniel Quilp belongs to the same category of Dickens' character as Uriah Heep and Wackford Squeers, thorough villains whose physical repulsiveness is exceeded only by that of their deeds. These are not subtle or nuanced characters, and that's fine. Their absolute baseness is what makes them so memorable. But with such absolute evil, a little goes a long way. Tragic monsters, misguided zealots, vengeful victims, audacious sociopaths, and other products of flawed societies and systems are able to carry more narrative weight because an audience can respond to them on multiple levels. With Quilp, all you can do is boo and hiss at his schemes, or cheer as he's vanquished. 
Giving him so much screen time just means his mugging and snarling wear out their welcome that much quicker. But apart from that problem, Newley himself isn't a good fit for this character. His song and dance man style would have been better suited for Swiveller. His singing voice is too light and high to give the appropriate sense of malice, and this just isn't a character who should be going into a soft shoe number. Quilp has a very full day of terrorizing everyone he comes across, from his lackey Tom to his ill-used yet devoted wife Betsy to Nell, who he's determined to marry just as soon as he can get Betsy to die under mysterious circumstances. Did we mention Nell is something like 14 years old? Yet another reason why Newley is miscast. It's like having Tommy Toon play Humbert Humbert. But the main object of his malice is Grandpa Trent, who has borrowed an absurd amount of money from Quilp and cannot or will not account for its whereabouts. Ah, my dear Mr. Quilp, what a pleasant surprise. What have you done with my gold, Trent? Swiveller arrives and puts a temporary halt to the terrorizing, and Nell drops a hint that the young man is in need of gainful employment. Thanks to a liberal helping of Booze and Swiveller's too trusting nature, Quilp is able to charm him and gets him a job as a clerk for his solicitors, Samson and Sally Brass, with a side hustle of spying on the Brasses for Quilp. This done, Quilp heads back home for a little more domestic abuse as he orders his wife to gain Nell's trust and figure out what her grandfather has been doing with his money. Every night and all night long he's away from home. But where does he go? What does he do? Right about now is when I became aware that this really isn't good source material for a musical. Several of Charles Dickens' tales do lend themselves well to the format in their epic scope or colorful characters, but everyone in the old curiosity shop is either too subdued for the passion of a musical or too dour for it. Even Ebenezer Scrooge has a kind of grandeur to his misanthropy that characters like Quilp and the Brasses lack. Not to put too fine a point on it, but this story just doesn't sing. So while Nell teaches the shop boy and kinda love interest Kit Nevels to write while they flirt in a pure innocent way and Grandpa stares morosely into space, Quilp pays a call to his solicitors. He's tired of subterfuge and has decided to foreclose on the curiosity shop and kick out the current occupants, as Swiveller goes from naive to just plain oblivious. But you surely wouldn't evict them. <laughs> like a shot if it suited my purpose. While Swiveller draws up the eviction notice and Sally Brass abuses the resident servant girl, Quilp launches into Sin Number 4, Send a Lawyer, a comic number that is somehow even more unsuitable than all his other unsuitable comic numbers. Now you may loaf away your life as a baker, and the only dough you'll raise won't raise a mouse. And can a farmer leave for work just like his neighbor? Oh no, sir. He wakes up with it all around the house. This goes on for quite some time. Seriously, it's like a little priest with twice the content and half the humor. It gets really bizarre as the abused servant girl and Swiveller get in on the vaudeville. So, Murphy, you want me to defend you? Have you got any money? Uh, no, but I do have a nanny goat, a rooster, and a fine fat pig. Oh, we should raise some money on those fine creatures. Now, what was it you were accused of stealing? Uh, a nanny goat, a rooster, and a fine fat pig. <laughs> After a hard day's work of feeding off straight lines, Swiveller befriends the servant girl, who he discovers is so poor and abused she doesn't even have a name. Well, I shall call you... Duchess. That's more a name you would give a cat, but no matter. Also in the book, Swiveller ends up marrying this character, I guess? You thought Quilp leering at Nell was creepy. Speaking of, he's taken over the curiosity shop and is doing as much mustache-twirling villainy as he can without having an actual mustache, causing Grandad to take to his bed and Nell to dream of a better life in an unusually soporific number. I have a dream, come there, come there, it's your somewhere, if only you try. Nell is successful in sneaking the shop key from the sleeping Quilp, and she and her grandfather slip off the soundstage. 
Quilp is enraged when he finds out the Trents have flown the coop and takes it out on Samson and Kit, as Nell and Grandfather enjoy a boring reprise in a pastoral setting. I'll make someone a heaven on earth But when I come to make my plans what follows is the long, dull stretch of Sin Number 5, as the Trents encounter an assortment of colorful Dickensian supporting characters, while Quilp sneers and storms periodically, and a mysterious gentleman starts inquiring after the Trents and befriending Kit, and Swiveller and the Duchess play cribbage, and none of the main characters really have anything to do with any of the others. Nell and Grandad fall in with some traveling players, but have to make a hasty retreat when Quilp shows up. There's a pointless ensemble number about horse racing. Then there's a nice old lady named Mrs. Jarley in a 19th century RV, who takes in our heroes and employs them in her traveling waxworks show. The mysterious gentleman rents an upstairs room from the Brasses and makes inquiries of every busker that passes under his window, which makes the Brasses suspicious, and so on and so forth. None of it is very engaging, and it doesn't help that this movie has the bland, washed-out look of so many lesser 60s and 70s productions. Looking at you, Camelot, and a little night music. The mysterious gentleman's efforts bear fruit when the puppeteers Nell and Grandad hooked up with are willing to provide information for a price and tell him about the waxwork tour. Quilp has been snooping about and has stuffed himself up the chimney like the Grinch, it sort of made sense in context. So he's able to overhear the gentleman and Kit discussing the Trent's last known whereabouts. Deciding Kit is too decent and honest for Quilp's own good, Quilp demands the Brasses to do something to neutralize the boy, which they do while being as obviously villainous as only obvious Dickens villains can be. Is there anything wrong, sir? Wrong? No, I never felt better in my life. The Brasses plant a five-pound note on Kit and accuse him of thievery, unaware that Duchess has overheard the entire plot. Meanwhile, the Trents are doing all right for themselves with Mrs. Jarley, but Grandad's gambling problem... He has a gambling problem. The movie was supposed to be dropping hints about it, but didn't do a good job. Rears its ugly head. Nell, my dear. Bring me your purse. No, Grandfather, no. Nell protests mildly, she does everything mildly, as Grandad wagers away all their money and also the nice coat Mrs. Jarley gave him. But she's so upset that later that night she has a really trippy nightmare about the whole business. Nell slips into Mrs. Jarley's room to sleep off whatever the here that was, so she's able to silently shame her grandfather when he sneaks in plotting to steal a little petty cash to cover his gaming debts. Realizing the temptation is too great for the old man, Nell forces the two of them to travel onward, resulting in the delicate cough that always spells doom for sweet Victorian girls. Back in London, Swiveller has also come down with a cold, but he's not a sweet Victorian girl, so he'll be fine. That's what you get for wickedness. You shouldn't have had Kit put away like that. It's your own fault. Kit deserved to go to prison. It'll teach the rascal not to steal. Kit didn't steal nothing. It was all Mr. Quilp's doing. Swiveller is shocked, shocked to learn the obviously evil Quilp could do something as obviously evil as frame an innocent boy. Brass instantly confesses to the whole affair and throws Quilp under the bus, because, honestly, that's what the obviously evil villain gets for abusing his slightly less obviously evil accomplice. So Kit is free to join the mysterious gentleman in tracking the Trents to Mrs. Jarley's caravan. Madam, you see in me someone to whom life itself is not more important than the two poor creatures we are looking for. Great, our villain is now stealing from the Scooby and Shaggy playbook. For some reason, nobody notices Quilp's exaggerated mugging until the local constable comes in with the card sharp that cleaned Grandad out, and it's revealed the old fool has gambled away every bit of money that has ever passed through his hands. Of all the thieving, lying, cheating scoundrels that the world has ever known, that man Trent has simply got to take the biscuit. Yes, newly decided now would be a good time for the bad guy to have a comical villain song about how he's offended that Grandpa Trent lost all his money at cards and didn't even have the decency to cheat. 
Now, when Nell is hurtling towards her deathbed and collapsing in the middle of a field, we're getting Quilp ranting at slapstick gravediggers. I wouldn't treat a chimpanzee like they treated me. Yes, that was an actual lyric. Quilp returns home to find Sally Brass in the middle of having him declared dead, and the fact that he's not upsets Mrs. Ginwin. She's Betsy's mom and really doesn't do much. I only mention her because Mrs. Ginwin is such a great Dickensian name. Sally informs Quilp that the jig is up, her brother's in jail, she's skipping town and he should do the same. But Quilp is so distracted with grabbing and or burning evidence and abusing his wife and fantasizing about murdering Samson that the authorities catch up to him. Quilp flees to the docks with Betsy, who honestly is making Nancy from Oliver Twist look like a model of feminine independence at this point, trailing behind. But he quickly loses his footing and falls in despite her efforts to save him. And yep, that's about it. Like everything else New Lease Quilp did, his death is dramatically inappropriate and very abrupt, while somehow also going on much longer than it needed to. And speaking of death, Kit and the mysterious gentleman, now revealed to be Henry Trent, Granddad's younger brother here to provide prosperity and security to his family through the miracle of dramatic convenience, have finally found Nell and Granddad at a church but they are far too late as Nell is in the final stages of too good for this sinful earth disease. I've forgotten how she looked Except she reminded me of spring And here the film's fatal error becomes inescapably apparent. Having spent so much time, energy, and musical numbers on Newley's grimacing villain, it has to take a sharp U-turn and attempt to wring every last bit of pathos it can out of Nell's fate, which isn't much because she's been so overshadowed by the bad guy's antics. The finale of The Old Curiosity Shop already generates a fair amount of criticism. Oscar Wilde once quipped that the only tears it was likely to induce were those of laughter, as the maudlin death of its absurdly noble heroine is so over the top it skirts the line of satire. And when we see an older Kit singing a tender ballad to Nell's memory as he reopens her family shop, this movie takes a flying leap over that line and never looks back. And every time she took a breath And clung to life, though scared to death And taught our hearts a lesson Mr. Quilp isn't the most boring and pointless musical out there. This is a world where It Couldn't Happen Here exists, after all. But it's a very tiresome watch. Anthony Newley is giving his all, but neither his acting style nor his music are suitable for the character he's playing, and none of the other characters make much of an impression. It's an exercise in tedium that mistakes itself for amusement, so the court of musical hell condemns those involved to an eternity of the old superstar limo ride. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>